and welcome to Traders Group. The Probably the most important thing that I'm looking at each day is the S&P 500 and of course I know what's happening on the Australian market and we'll have a look at that but there's two things or two two markets that are a bit, um, they were it was a bit uh, puzzling. But one's this, this market here, it's the S&P 500 because as I mentioned last week, if this was an accumulation phase, which is maintaining uh, accumulation on a long-term trend line, the behaviour of accumulation is one that once the right-hand side of the pattern comes in, you get a large extension to the upside. And for the first time in, uh, in, in decades, I suppose, that's not what's going on. So the first thing is I just want to point out that the behaviour of this market, and I think I brought this up last week, it is not what I would expect in an accumulation phase. Now if I just go to any other accumulation phase, I don't need to go very far to look at the large, extent, large extensions that you get as the market uh, moves to the upside, um, you know, from the bottom of a uh, accumulation phase. And I'm not sure if my screen, there it goes, my screen hadn't switched over. I think you know I've got screens within screens and I'm looking at one screen and it's moved and the other one hasn't. So these extensions, that's, that's the common behaviour of the right hand side of an accumulation pattern. If we just go back to the current market, as I'm pointing out, that's not what's going on. And I've been wringing my hands today trying to explain what is going on because there's also one other market that's doing exactly the same thing and I think I finally got the answer. Uh, Alan pointed out that this is probably looking more like a, a symmetrical triangle, which uh, is probably more accurate than trying to pretend it's a W pattern or anything else. Uh, if it's a symmetrical triangle, which it probably is, um, symmetrical triangles usually break 75% uh, into the apex of the pattern, and we are clearly, uh, if not there already, a bit beyond 75%. So you would expect this to at some point break out of the triangle pattern. Hopefully this next move to the upside is exactly what we see. Um, the reason for the non-performance of this accumulation phase, it's still accumulation, it's just a different, very rare uh, accumulation phase, is connected to another chart. Let me take you across uh, because I, I was looking at the Chinese market today, and I'm saying the same things. Why are the Chinese market, why is the Chinese market not going anywhere? If I bring up the, um, first of all, FXI, and we look at FXI, and it's, 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 a, uh, it's a, not a symmetrical triangle, it's a uh, declining triangle, but it's still a triangular pattern that hasn't broken to the upside and uh, it's essentially going nowhere. And then I come across to the Shanghai Composite, just for a bit of depth. I'll slow down because Phil's just coming into the room. I'm just slowing down, waiting for Phil to get sound. When I come across to the, the actual Shanghai Composite, what I see is another uncompleted accumulation phase. So here's the commonality. We've got both the US and China uh, not going anywhere. And they haven't been going anywhere for the last two months. Not only are they not going anywhere, when you'd expect them to be breaking to the upside and taking the rest of the world with them, they're stagnating. So what's the commonality between the two markets? Trump is the only thing that I could think of this unresolved so-called discussion of trade wars is the common link between these two markets. And since Trump started to ramp up his uh, talk about trade war, although he seems to have backed off recently, uh, both these markets have just stagnated. And um, I think up until something is a little bit clearer as to what will be um, done in, in, from the aspect of uh, from the perspective of the US. I probably don't anticipate any large movement, although that said, the rest of the world is now disconnecting from China and the US. And that's what's really weird. If we, we know what's happening in Australia because we live here, we know it's had a major break in the last week. 
We know if we go have a look at other markets in Europe, they've had major breaks to the upside in the last week. But I'll just point out that that's the only fundamental rationale I can think why this hasn't completed accumulation and we're still in the context of the US market uh, mucking around trying to form a base in the form of a triangle. And um, Alan, as I'm talking, has just pointed out um, what is IWM like, IWM being the Russell 2000, and IWM is a lot more sensitive to the market than we could put in. Let's, let's, let's draw a few patterns on this one. Again, it's, I'm really hard pressed to call it W's and inverted head and shoulders pattern, but I think what we could call this is again, it's, a, it's another, it's almost not quite, we could almost make it into a symmetrical triangle. And it also is coming into 75% of the depth of the, uh, you know, getting near the apex, and therefore that is the point where it should break out to the upside. Um, a common thread with both markets, or all the indexes in the US and China, is that they are extremely well supported by institutional buying volume. So don't be, I'm not saying anything negative here, I'm just saying the, the markets of uh, of late, of ground, and international markets, have ground to a halt uh, at a time where I would have expected them to be making very large moves. Maybe this is me wishful thinking, because we're coming up to the end of the financial year, and I want to see the portfolios that I'm holding do really well. Maybe that's what's driving my thinking. Uh, that said, um, um, I believe I'm probably right. It has to be a fundamental driving. It's not North Korea. It's not Syria, it's not Iran, it's none of that. All that's, all that's in check. It can only be um, the forecast of unresolved issues in terms of trade wars, and both markets are exhibiting the same personality. I want to compare and contrast IWM, S&P 500, and uh, the Chinese market against European markets. If I come across to, first of all, EWG, EWG being the exchange traded fund, it is looking not super robust, but it has broken out of its triangle and looks like it's getting prepared to do a higher low if it continues on this evening. If I compare and contrast EWG against the DAX, it has done a significant breakout in the last two nights. It has completed its uh, W accumulation pattern. I'm now going to clean up this pattern to make it look pretty. It did a shallow pullback, which went back to the average. That pullback resided on top of the previous swing high, and it broke to the upside. That's very, that's, that's, that's very strong. That's actually uh, high in momentum, because it had a very shallow pullback. So the DAX is breaking out. Because our friendly French uh, Prime Minister was in Sydney uh, today and yesterday, I thought I'd have a look at the CAC, the CAC being the French index. And I noticed the CAC has done an amazing breakout. I don't really follow French markets, but um, it has also done this amazing uh, test, retest, but it's not the amazing test, retest. It's the break of this market. In fact, I'm just going to go to a weekly chart. One second. Now, here's, here's something interesting. The French market's about to break in a, into an all-time new high. So... Europe is not weak. Europe is actually really strong. Australia is really strong. North America is, is, is stagnating. And, and, and as we've already discussed, the uh, Chinese market is stagnating. If I come across now to the Australian market, first of all, looking at EWA, which is the exchange traded fund, EWA had a nice break to the upside last night, which was uh, coming back to, I just need to come to a daily chart of EWA. It had a really nice break to the upside, which is totally kind of opposite to what happened in the US indices. And um, and that looks like, I don't know how to describe this. I suppose but I, could, I could put a triangle pattern on this one as well. It's really, it's too tough to be calling it anything else. Just give me one moment. There's no other, no, no other description for it. Let's just call them all triangle patterns. Um, it has, it looks like it's about to break out with a higher low 
which will be confirmed if it has another move tonight. That'll be the first higher low from the retest down at 21.60. So EWA is looking good on US markets. Compare and contrast that to XJO. One would have thought with the daily diet of negative news from the Royal Commission on the banking sector that we would be getting uh, more pain in the markets. I think what has happened is the pain is over. Um, the markets, irrespective of the negative news, have or, had, had already and have, have already factored it in because uh, financial markets are discounting mechanisms. They forward, they look into the future and they discount the future. It's already been factored into the market. We didn't have to hear what's happening within this Royal Commission to know there was a, uh, a ton of bad news on the way. Unfortunately, as that news uh, hit the markets in the last few weeks, I would imagine most retail investors selling their banking shares only to have them snapped up by the very institutions that are at the Royal Commission. Don't believe it's not happening. There's no justice in finance because there has to be a reason why this market's broken out. And there's only two big sectors within our market which are driving our market. One's finance, and we said this many times, the other's metals and mining. And finance looks like it's bottom, but it's making a break. For it to make a significant break, uh, it's not retail traders. Re retail investors are not the primary drivers of our local market. It's institutions. So I think I'm probably right. The sad story is that people that have given up hope by listening to too much television are now getting a double dose of being shafted. And I don't mean to laugh because it's, it's really bad. Probably double dose of being shafted with the, uh, you know, with the institutions and also fund managers coming in and buying this. Let's just go check out the um, some of the uh, sectors in the Australian market. Well, the primary, the two that I really like to watch, that's XMM, metals and mining. I know it's not materials, but it's the major driver because of our economy is a commodity-based economy. It's the major driver of uh, the material sector, and we can see it's having a really nice break. And as I was talking, someone's typing in. Okay, so. Um, okay, there's heaps of people talking to me while I'm talking. I'll read them all out it's all good stuff. So Alan said, what index have forced that breakout? That's what we're discussing right now. Uh, we should be seeing accumulation patterns in the bank. That's from Bill. And then Bill just added to that. that I believe it's probably happening. So let's go, and so metals and mining is one of the cornerstones of our index, which I like to see driving the market up. It was up 1.7% today, which is a pretty impressive move, with XJO up 0.88%. This has only just happened. If we just go back to XJO before we do finance, uh, looking at XJO, this inverted head and shoulders pattern that we drew on screen uh, a squill in uh, weeks ago, um, has just broken its neckline and uh, and the right hand side of the pattern for most of this month when I say this month I, I'm sorry I meant last month for the for most of last month was extremely low momentum it's only in the last one two three four five it's only the last five sessions where this market has accelerated and started to to do something really interesting and as we can see it's now broken out of the Break it out of this, uh, out of the pattern. What should happen, I would suggest, is it shouldn't continue. Uh, you know, shouldn't continue straight up. It could do whatever it's going to do, but patterns don't normally, uh, markets don't normally go that hard. And the, and do you know this because we've said this a billion times. Where is the market right now in relation to the 20 period moving average? It's way above it. So. I think it's reasonable to suggest in the not too distant future, maybe we have another day up. We start to get the backfill and we start to get a right shoulder and that's when the market really starts to um, make a move. I would be delighted to see it not stop because it's all good. You know, no one's complaining. We've got a falling Australian dollar. That's good. We've got a uh, strongly rising market and maybe the currency effect of um, – of our market is one of the factors because if you go have a look at the Australian market, the uh, Aussie dollar has fallen dramatically. Maybe that is uh, has an also in, uh, intermarket related 
impact on what's happening on our market. Uh, if I just go and grab the uh, the high and the low of this range so far, uh, normally what we will note is that markets uh, will, I'm just going to do that again, just give me one moment. Normally markets go up 100% um, of the depth of the pattern. Now previously I've calculated extensions and maybe it's the same extension that I'm about to do. I'm just going to grab the range again, grab the high, grab the low of the range, mark it up from the breakout and uh, it equates with other ranges that I've done previously. Um, I think it's exactly the same, so I've already done it. So this particular market, if you did 100% extension from the breakout, it gets to 64.21. Uh, I don't think it can get there, uh, you know, straight away, but that's the target. That would be lovely, and a little bit of backfill, and I moved up there by end of this financial year, and we'll be all happy if you've got a Australian portfolio, we'll do above 10%. Okay, so that'd be good. So coming back to the primary drivers of this, uh, it has to be finance. So obviously finance has to be one of the major contributors. And when we come along across to FX, um, sorry, XXJ, which is the finance chart minus the real estate investment trust. Uh, if you had to ask me four or five last week, I would have said this market is about to break into a new low. So within a week, it didn't break into a new low. It didn't close below its previous swing low. It's done a test. It's done a retest of that low. And then the market's gone up and crossed its midpoint once again. It's gone a little bit too hard too fast. It probably needs to backfill, put in a V pattern and then take off again in whatever form that does. Can it keep on going up? Of course it can keep on going up. But obviously there'll be a pullback before the next big move. And that would push it above that long-term downward trend line which has been occurring since October, and that would give me great hope. So I'm hoping, as much as you're hoping, that all these ghastly stories, which are all true that we hear on TV about our financial community, uh, they're not over and done with, but hopefully the majority of the bad stuff's off the table, and the market now has already factored in the worst-case scenarios and is uh, basically ignoring any further negative news. It's already been... It's already there. That was what this big fall has been about since October last year, factoring in, uh, I don't know when that um, the Royal Commission was announced, but it's factored in. It always, The market always does that. And I repeat, unfortunately, the poor souls that started selling uh, five days ago would not be happy if this market keeps on going up. Looking at other aspects of our market, there are lots of really good sectors within our market. And uh, one of the leading sectors at the moment is healthcare. And uh, healthcare is breaking into new highs. When I look at all other sectors, and you ignore, I think I might have said this last week, and I ignore finance, the market looks really quite healthy being held back by, uh, you know, by finance. So healthcare looked really good. Just going to check out a few others. Information technology, that's not looking too shabby. It just broke into a new high. Energies is about to break into a new high. Consumer discretionaries has made an explosive move in the last few days and will break into a new high. But once again, look at the chart in relation to the average. Everything is overextended. Don't go and buy. <laughs> Don't go buy, have a trade tomorrow, or you'll be very sadly upset when the market does its pullback. And, uh, and here's industrial. So it doesn't matter what I look at. In the last five days, uh, you know, there's been some really exciting moves if I come across and match up that information to a sector rotation chart, just focusing on Australia, the strongest sector in Australia right now is healthcare, led secondly by information technology, third is consumer staples, fourth is the industry called metals and mining slash material sector, fifth is energies, uh, and then uh, consumer discretionary industrials, property trusts, you know, then we come into the weaker sectors, but evolving 
property trusts, finance, utilities, and telecoms, which is a which is horrible, and uh, continues to be horrible. So I think it's pretty clear where the opportunity lay. It lays in the top six sectors, and um, and healthcare is the leader at the moment. Be careful with healthcare. I think you've got some of the stocks such as CSL, which has international exposure, is um, I, I really probably should go look at the sector or the, or the weighting of some of these stocks because our market is so so thin. Some stocks dominate particular industries and sectors. So um, sometimes you talk about healthcare having a run. It's actually two stocks, two you know two dominant stocks. Not always the case, but just something I've observed. So I've got nothing negative to say about Australia, both technically, fundamentally as this finance story clears itself, it's all good and I just, fingers crossed, uh, hope it continues up for the next two months. Uh, we always like good annual returns, not lousy annual returns, and I should get some good annual returns if it keeps on going. Okay, so just a little bit last, a little bit of information to finish off the Australian market. Just coming back to the chart on the Australian market, I just like to look at the VIX. I just want to see if there's any fear crept into the market. It can be a warning signal with the market going up and the VIX going up, but that is not the case. Although, that's interesting, today's bar is a little bit of an anomaly and tells me what may happen tomorrow. So you can see today the market went up strong, and this is the Australian VIX. Yet the VIX, there's a big green VIX bar on screen, which tells me something that I think we already know. That is, the markets have had five days of extreme upward move. It would not be unrealistic to expect some of that uh, price action above the moving average to wash off in the next few days. Hence, you're getting a little bit of activity on the VIX and that could be a little bit of forewarning for a bit of a pullback to consolidate the gains that have been made, which are very significant. Just coming back to the um, S&P 500, I just want to look at the VIX on the S&P 500 to see if there's anything to be forewarned on this particular chart. And I see nothing of any interest. All as I see, there's a downward trending VIX chart with you know no evidence of elevation. It's very calm heading towards its historical low, which would be 10. It's currently at 15. There's nothing to be said. There's nothing to be observed. It's just interesting. Coming back to the S&P 500 once again, we noticed that last night the market had a night down. And just comparing that small night down, which was 0.72 to the downside, against the current overnight market, We've got a market which looks like it's probably going to bounce off. I would be surprised if it didn't bounce off this trend line. But that's what it looks like it's doing. And the overnight markets are up 0.28, which has captured a you know, fairly decent chunk already of the downward move last night. So I would not be surprised to see this market recapture maybe all of it. Usually when it hits, every time it's hit that trend line, You've seen rather large rejections of one to two points or more. So um, when I say points, I'm talking SPY points. I'm trading SPY, so I'm always thinking in terms of that. So I would not be surprised for this market to jump in between those two uh, horizontal thin blue lines, which is what I need the market to do to make money in a position I've got. Okay, so just coming off the... International markets coming across. Oh, I haven't finished one thing. Before I get off the S&P 500, I just want to go across to uh, and identify the strongest sectors within that market. Looking at the US market, the strongest sectors in this market. It's not a sector, but we've been talking about it for many weeks. USO, Texas Light Crude is a commodity. It's a division of energies. And it's as, as we know the story, because we, we followed the story, it led energies in the last two months. Number two is consumer discretionary. Number three is the tech sector. Number four is XME, which is the metals and mining. Telecoms, which I don't really bother with because they're so thin, are also looking like they've gained a lot of strength. 
um, and then comes in uh, finance, industrials, uh, healthcare, the weakest sectors, the two weakest sectors in the US market that you would not have any holdings in and or you would not be bothering to trying to trade because they're going nowhere, are XLP, which is consumer staples, XLU, and materials. And I, and I separate the material sector in the US from metals and mining. Uh, material sector is a lot more complex in the United States. Um, so XME is a division of metals of, of materials, and I treat it. It's not a different sector, but I just like to have it on screen because it's got such heavy influence on our market. Okay, so let me just shift across to other elements of our market, namely gold, the Australian dollar, US dollar, and I'll have a bit of a uh, more close inspection of XME, metals and mining. Coming down to, first of all, the currencies, I prefer to see the currencies or FXA fall. Why do I like FXA to fall? Because, as you know, I've got US dollars. And this fall in the Australian dollar is in some way, in some part, contributing to what we're seeing on equ equities markets. I literally do not have the time or the brain space to work out intermarket relationships between currency and equity markets. But I am very, very aware that those relationships exist. And if I worked hard enough, if I had enough time in the day, I could give you a story about the movement of our Australian dollar and our market. It's not too difficult to think that the uh, contracts that we have in mining, to give you a simplistic explanation, are written in US dollars. Hence, all those companies that are holding US dollars or have business in the US as a result of holding US currency uh, uh, exposure in their portfolio in their company, they're obviously benefiting by decline in the Australian dollar, which is a positive boost to their equity price. So it's not a, it's not a big ask to think, how could this be? How could a currency affect an equity market? It's fairly easy. The deal is, though, with this move in the Australian dollar, it has done something which is a little bit beyond normal. And we've been tracking this since 2016 in this big, big, broad channel on a weekly chart. And for the first time, for two weeks running, we've seen the uh, currency break to the downside. In addition to that breaking to the downside, it is supported by negative institutional selling volume, which tells me it hasn't finished yet and will continue into the future. Um, it only is going to cease when we come back to a weekly chart and we go through the evolution of accumulation. So this is going down to otherwise advised, and it is going down with a strongly sloping downward moving average. It has to go through all that process that we've talked about 100 times before, putting in some sort of basing structure, supported by institutional buying volume, breaking above trend lines, all that stuff doesn't exist on screen. Therefore, if we live in the present and try and not pretend we can see into the future, as I stand here today, it's still going down. You'd expect that the reverse would be true with the US dollar. If we have a look at the US dollar trade on the Australian market via the Australian Securities Exchange, first of all, going to a weekly chart, we'd hopefully see a direct opposite replication, and we do. This particular market has, for the first time in a long time, put its head above this downward moving sloping large trend line. That said, it can you know, come back inside it, but it is, a, I suppose, an interesting higher low. And the volume behavior within the US dollar index has strongly, extremely strongly to the positive. Therefore, looking at both charts, looking at the volume charts, I'd have to suggest that this upward break in US dollar inverse relationship to the Australian dollar and other currency pairs, uh, our Aussie dollar should continue to the downside in the near future. As there's an inverse relationship on the US dollar and gold, we would expect downward pressure on gold. If we come across to a gold chart, looking at GLD, staying on a weekly chart, uh, only a few weeks ago, I was in fact only two weeks ago, if I flip my pages across, so I keep detailed records of what I say, I said two weeks ago, um, on the gold, that's an uptrend now supported by a rising vol. And I write the volume numbers on screen. I said that two weeks ago. 
it's coming back to a daily chart. And the reason I said it, because that volume was supported by the evolution of what looked like to be a W pattern, which is starting to form a trend. Last week, it broke that upward trend, and the, re and the volume uh, completely reversed the opposite and has increasingly gone negative at a higher rate of change as of this week. Therefore, if I look at gold, um, it's not as it's not as brutal as the uh, as the FXA, but it is uh, pointing down. It is it looks like it's about to break a long-term trend, and it is supported by significant um, uh, of vanishing buying volumes. Just give me one moment. I need a quick drink. Okay, so gold is is a, is, is a pseudo currency. It is being pressured by the upward movement in the U.S. dollar. Um, upward movements in the U.S. dollar is a depressing uh, element. Talking about intermarket relationships on say things like commodities. Why? Uh, because if you get a rising U.S. dollar, everything that's written in uh, in uh, US dollar contracts obviously are more expensive therefore uh, generally commodities will be not necessarily declining straight away but will be impacted eventually if you get a strongly rising US dollar. One small piece of evidence that, that may be already occurring is if I now switch across to oil because I've been talking up oil now for many many weeks I'm not going to go back on my pad now, if we look at the numbers this week, in fact, in the last few weeks, uh, I kept on saying, I'm just going back, rising volume, rising chart. I was just really a real cheerleader in the last three weeks for the oil market, and um, something's changing. There is still significant positive volume, but it's not as strong as it was in the past few weeks. And that could be an effect of currencies. And I can see the chart also that it looks like it's continuing to the upside. But often, uh, you know, there are indications that uh, in terms of, I suppose, institutional training activity, that this may not be continuing. Now, at this point in time, if you ask me technically what's it doing, I'd have to say it's going, obviously going to the upside. But, but in the next two weeks, if I am right, the strength of this move may be slowing down, and if we see any break of trend, it may reverse. I'm not suggesting that yet. I think that's a bit, getting a little bit too cheeky to suggest that. I've just noticed that the, the buying volumes are not as significant as they were last week, which sometimes is the beginning of a switch in the markets. Other disappointments within this market that I follow, but maybe not highlight on a weekly basis, I've been a great follower of robo stocks, that is, stocks that are connected to new forms of uh, automation. In fact, uh, when I bring up this stock, and I, I, I do uh, own zero robo stocks, I, were trading, I was trading them last year, uh, but then I never, after I got out of all my shares back in um, late December, I never re-entered uh, any, and I'm glad I haven't because this chart looks pretty damn horrible. And um, when I look at the robo stocks, they are looking bleak. I haven't gone over every single one, um, but I have not lost faith. Faith, uh, I believe they are a significant should be a significant driver of U.S. markets, but they have definitely gone off the boil in the last three months. I haven't really looked at uh, financial tech stocks. That's really bullish, that chart. That's a really bullish chart. I'm going to have to go have a look at this. Why is it bullish? Because of this. It's an ascending trail pattern. That's really quite bullish. I'll check that out, and I'll check out some of the stocks underneath that particular index in the next week. Um, and the other ones that I had been watching uh, late last year was uh, BOTZ, again, really disappointing. It's artificial uh, intelligence and robotics. There's just nothing happening there. 
Uh, the other one was uh, GAMR, which was video game machines. That looks a lot better than the other two. And there are others that uh, I could be looking at, like uh, blockchain style shares, which have gone off the boil uh, since Bitcoin has gone off the boil. That does not mean that blockchain is going to disappear. In fact, blockchain is going to come back. It, it simply hasn't evolved to the point where it's been embedded and has got the practical, uh, practical applications throughout the finance and business world. It, it is being widely researched in its application as a technology that could greatly increase the efficiency and lower transaction costs within finance. So uh, it's not going super duper at the moment, but I'll come back to blockchain um, and uh, we'll, we'll revisit that as well as um, the Finex group of uh, shares. Just while I mention, um, mention Bitcoin, I am, a, I am not at all an advocate of uh, this fantasy called Bitcoin. And uh, I have a lot of grief from my nephews. Uh, over my views, but there's something really interesting about this. This is the uh, futures chart of Bitcoin, and I'm into looking for pattern behavior. And I noticed that in February, the S&P 500 had a significant low. I noticed in April, the S&P 500 had a significant low. Now, I don't know whether this is going to keep it keep on doing it. It's starting to act like an equities market, which is completely unexplainable, but I'll see. I've got no, I've got very little information on Bitcoin. All I've got is a futures chart, which is traded on, I think, CME. Uh, I just thought it was an interesting coincidence. We'll see how that evolves. Other than that, I have zero interest in, I do enough gambling. I've got enough finance. I don't need to go and go into some fantasy product. Okay. Final comments on global markets. The volume behaviors in the last week, talking back to S&P 500, the volumes in terms of buying volumes have backed off a bit, but that's totally explainable because the market's backed off and they do, but it's not super significant. Um, other bits of information that are significant are things like advancing and declining stocks, new highs, new lows, and there has been a reasonable decline over the last three weeks in advancing and declining. Three weeks ago, there were 304 advancing, 186 declining. Last week, 242 advancing, 248 declining. This week, 208 uh, advancing, 280 declining. More significantly than the numbers themselves is the volumes. And there is a 30% increase in the declining stock volume, that is the volumes of shares, not the number, yeah, the volumes traded. So that's significant, but we're at a point where we come back to this trend line. So it's not, it's not unusual and it should reverse very quickly as this market does its bounce in the next few days. In terms of new highs and new lows, three weeks ago, there are eight new highs, three new lows last week. 14 new highs, 8 new lows, and this week, uh, 10, new, 10 new highs and 17 new lows. Again, uh, I, I don't want to read anything into that chart. They're not, the numbers are not dramatic, so absolutely, it is what it is. Nothing catches my eye to say something's happening. It's fine. It's just normal behavior when a market goes up and down. Coming across to some local shares that uh, Alan... Uh, watches and uh, has brought up in the last few weeks. Uh, I would note that FBR had a significant break uh, in the past week. And I think I mentioned that last week, had a big pullback and another big move to the upside. TTT uh, also has had a significant break out of this triangle pattern that I probably drew up last week. Uh, and CLQ, which is one of Alan's favourites, uh, this is uh, New Zealand, Alan. I've got two Alans in the room. I've got an Alan R and an Alan H. I'm talking about New Zealand, Alan. Has posted a document within Facebook. And uh, in that document is a report on cleantech 
and an announcement which is all good reading. If you're interested in that particular stock, there goes some fundamental underpinning for your technical work and gives you some sort of idea what the company does, what they're doing, what they're proposing into the near future. When I look at the CLQ chart, it looks grim to me and I would need to see the evolution of accumulation on screen before I would re-engage with this stock, irrespective of what the fundamentals are and what a broker is saying to talk up a stock because I need to sell some shares. Uh, it is in a obviously a strong downtrend at the moment. Of course that can change, but it's not changing at the moment. If I just overlay, just out of interest, just give me one moment. I'm going to put up a um, one moment if I've got them. Uh, yes, I have. Just one moment. Just type in something. Ah, damn it. I triggered some sort of fire. E signal, stop working. Damn it. Okay, just give me one moment. I'm just going to request to another request. Okay, what I was trying to do is. I was interested in looking at uh, CLQ, but then looking at the volume, because what can happen is a stock can be declining and there can be big institutional buyers coming in, which tells me something is afoot uh, or, or some form of large buying behavior. And as I've got no data on screen, and it's not bringing any in, I can't actually look at it. I'm just going to pull up another share, just uh, something like NAB to see if it can trigger, but I think Something's just gone wrong with my eSignal data feed, and I'm not going to be able to show you anything. Okay, let's drop that one. Oh, here we go. So NAB, that came in. Okay, let me just try CLQ one more time. Okay, so this is what I was looking for. The stock's moving down, and I'm looking for some sort of buying behavior in the background, which could be illustrated by volume pressure. And as you can see, now, the only two volume charts that I've got for uh, Australian stocks is accumulation distribution on balance volume, and I look pretty horrible. So there's no buying in the background. There's nothing happening in the background. There's no one accumulating large parcels of stock. It looks like it's, it is what it is. It's going down. Okay, uh, another stock that Alan has given me on the local market, which uh, could be very interesting, is WTC. Just type in WT. C and I'm just going to go to the price chart to start with. We'll look at volume in a moment. WTC is uh, looks like it has put in a base, and uh, that is a base most definitely. And uh, I'm just trying to work out what sort of pattern I'll give it. Uh, I think the most appropriate pattern. I could do a very crude inverted head and shoulders pattern, but I'll avoid that, and I'll just cut through a few of the swings and put in a retest which is a higher low and a confirmation and the confirmation exists with a move which is dramatically above the moving average. If this particular uh, accumulation pattern which is now establishing its first trend and it's all above the flattening to rising 20 period moving average definitions that you know very well is supported by rising volume I would get quite interested in it. At this point in time volumes are just turning the corner what you'll see is that pattern completes and does its uh, V, or the WV pattern, and you see volumes kick in and break trend, it's, it's, it would be of interest. It would be of interest, definitely. So that's, a, that's a actually uh, definitely something to watch, and I'm just going to have to write it on my pad. Last time Alan gave me this, I put it in my portfolio, and I've done very well. And... I think you gave me, what was it, LYC or something? I put in my, my portfolio and it's looking great. So just give me one moment. It has had a significant gain. Alan just said it's a 5% gain. So just be aware that you wouldn't buy into this share after a 5% gain. You want to wait for it does its pullback. You know it's going to happen. It takes patience to do. So don't jump in straight away. Okay, so just having a look at um, other shares that Alan gave me in a list. Uh, first of all, I might just type in LYC. Uh, 
Alan gave us this weeks and months and months ago. And I bought it back in wherever I got back into my portfolio. And it uh, looks like it's having a really nice breakout. In terms of volume, this is the volume picture that I like to see with a stock that's going to keep on ramping to the upside, both on balance volume and accumulation and distribution are strongly tracking to the upside with a stock which is strongly tracking to the upside with shallow pullbacks. You can't get any better than that. Technically, it's a good looking stock. Other shares that Alan's put in the screen would be Healthcare, SIG, and IPH. Let's have a look at those two. First of all, IPH. Okay, it's just taking a little while to download. Um, okay, this is uh, obviously a share that's had a huge fall. I'm just going to go to a weekly chart. It's not a strong momentum stock to the upside. It's a stock that's had a strong fall. I just need to see a big picture of it before I can make a comment. And then I'm going to have a look at the volume picture. Okay, it looks kind of horrible. It's come from $9, it's now at $3.50. Is that a buy? I personally couldn't do this. I couldn't buy it. But I'm just going to come back to a daily and have a look at the volume. The only thing that would convince me to buy it would be a strongly moving volume picture, which it does actually look like it's kicking in. And I suppose you'd expect volume to be kicking in because it's doing this rounded bottom, which I can't put any pattern on. It might, might end up to be a cup and saucer pat pattern, just very crudely. That would be the best way I could describe it. Once again, this particular share is uh, way above its trend line. Oh, sorry, did I say trend line? I meant to say moving average. Therefore, uh, it'll do a handle at some point. You don't jump in tomorrow. You wait for the pullback. And that would be, in conjunction with increasing volume, a, 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 a nice stock to invest in, I suppose. With stops, it'll be fine. I, I personally wouldn't. I like strongly trending, upward moving stocks. Um, so this wouldn't be my first choice, but it's, it's, it's possible. Okay, the last one would be SIG. Just type in that. SIG ASX. SIG ASX. It's just taking a few moments to punch up on screen. Okay, it also, if I do this on a, on a weekly chart, <clears throat> it's also a, a strongly downward trending stock. Um, one moment. It's a healthcare stock, uh, strongly downward trending. If I just come across to a back to a daily chart, I'm going to do a compare and comparison of SIG, strongly downward trending. I know it's broken up in the last few days. The volume looks horrible. I personally, again, uh, I, can't, I couldn't invest in that stock. Or I wouldn't bother it with it. This is why. If I compare and contrast that with another uh, stock like CSL. Uh, let's just do CSL. The difference in the two stocks, let's go to a weekly chart just to give it a fair comparison. Uh, one is strongly trending up the screen. The other was strongly trending down the screen. That's a fairly significant and not unreasonable point to make. If we go and have a look at the daily chart, opening up the daily chart, and then compare the volume picture behind the daily chart, what we'll see is a strong upward moving on balance volume and on, on an accumulation and distribution. Therefore, uh, one chart, CSL, is infinitely stronger than the other chart, if you compare and contrast. So if I had a choice, you now know what, what I would be thinking. I'm going for the strongly trending chart with high volume support if that makes sense. Okay, um, I haven't bothered looking at my portfolio, but I know healthcare have been punching north. So I'm just gonna very quickly, I hold CSL, I hold COH, nice breaks, I hold PRY, hasn't moved, I hold ANN, nice break. I hold RMD and that's it for the 
healthcare looking okay. Okay, guys, I think <clears throat> we've done a fairly reasonable assessment of uh, global markets and local markets, and um, I think it is time to wind it up. I'm just slowing down so I can look at my pad to make sure I haven't missed anything. No, I haven't missed anything. That's it for this evening. Thank you very much, and I look forward to talking to you personally or seeing you online same time next week. Have a great week. Thank you.